I think it's going to ask you your authorization for recording. I'm not sure. It's, I think it's different by jurisdiction. Like for me, it just like pops up and says it's recording now. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, hi everyone. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a very exciting moment. Um, so, uh, it's, it's the start of, uh, of a very new initiative that is uh, trying to answer a very urgent need regarding the coronavirus uh, outbreak. And, um, and it's, it's a very, there is a very general uh, problem that um, uh, the testing abilities of the, of the governments in general are not at the level where they can test all citizens and, uh, and, and provide measures to, uh, well, to, 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 um, you know, to, 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 to know what, uh, what is the real status, you know, of the, of the, of the pandemic, basically. Uh, and, and we're talking mostly of, of countries where we have news, so developed countries. So uh, in most uh, developing countries, the case is even worse, most probably. So um, the idea of this initiative uh, is to uh, work together uh, as a community to design what would be a completely open source uh, diagnosis test for the coronavirus. Um, why open source? Uh, the idea is that um, anyone in the world would be able to potentially manufacture it uh, and distribute it uh, as long as it is within you know, safety measures. Um, so, so there is a big need for that. Uh, and why, why doing it uh, using a uh, community approach? Um, I think it's because it's, it's faster, uh, it's probably more efficient, uh, it's way, 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 way uh, also uh, cheaper for the world. We can all learn from it, uh, from this whole process. And it's fun. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be a fun challenge uh, for anyone. Oops, the, the light is getting off automatically at, at 9 p.m. Um, just, just a minute, I'm going to put it back. And uh, so, to uh, to <laughs> to to start the call um, uh, with uh, with Zach, uh, we've been working uh, on this um, project since the beginning. Um, the idea is that we, uh, as you can see on the document I've shared with you, uh, we have a few objectives for this call. Uh, the first one would be to to reintroduce each other uh, to each other. Uh, and, and also to agree upon um, like a feasible goal for this initiative. Um, also, like how much time do we think that this is going to, uh, to, you know, to, uh, to take basically. Uh, also to agree upon uh, sub-objectives and, uh, and also uh, identifying uh, members of this community that would like to take upon uh, like a more uh, higher responsibility role uh, like leading one of the sub-objectives, for example, or facilitating uh, the whole community process, for example. Um, and then finally, agreeing also on the, on the tools that we want to use. Uh, right now, we're using Google Doc, uh, and there may be also alternatives. Uh, if one wants to propose something else that is better, we are open to it, um, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to, to start introducing myself. Uh, so my name is Thomas Landrin. I'm based in Paris, in France. Uh, I'm a former researcher in synthetic biology. I'm now an entrepreneur, and uh, I've started several uh, initiatives. One is uh, the first biohacker space in France called La Payas, uh, about a company called Pili, who is ma manufacturing um, biological dyes for the industry using synthetic biology. And now I'm also the co-founder uh, and CEO of Drogo, Just One Giant Lab, uh, was aim is really to facilitate this kind of initiative where um, how do we manage um, mobilizing a large community of contributors for common interest goals uh, for humanities, basically. Uh, so, so it's a very good proof of concept, uh, you know, this, this project. You know, I think uh, at the end, uh, one of the reasons why also I really wanted to, uh, to, to work on... Computer. Oh, hi, Rachel. <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, one, one of the reasons uh, I really wanted to, uh, to uh, work on this project within Drogo is that this is like the real aim of, of Drogo. Uh, and if we can succeed also doing this, it's a good proof to the world that uh, distributed communities 
uh, and distributed collaboration uh, is efficient and could be applied to uh, even more goals uh, you know, in, in general. So this is very exciting. Uh, I'm going to leave the, <laughs> the floor to, uh, to Zach. Zach, could you introduce yourself too? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, Zach Muller, I'm based in Seattle, Washington, US. Uh, I've been involved in kind of community bio stuff for probably more than five years now. Wow, long time. Um, so I co-founded a community bio lab here in Seattle called Sound Bio. Uh, and I have helped out with kind of organizing the bio summit over the media lab for a few years and just helped generally with a lot of things. And I kind of just caught wind of this project that Tomas started on Sunday, like a few days ago, and it just seemed really interesting. So I kind of jumped in and started like messaging it out to a lot of people. And I've got a lot of people signed up and hopefully things can start rolling uh, pretty quickly. I know there's a bunch of students from my past item teams at Sound Bio that are super excited and super capable and they're gonna help run like a community project as a support this project uh, both locally and globally. Um, and yeah, so that's it for me. Let's do kind of a popcorn style. So like mention who should go next. Uh, so how about Kat, why don't you go next? Hey, so um, I'm Kat. I'm also from Seattle, Washington, US. Um, I was on the SoundBio iGEM team for the 2018 and 2019 season um, and was a team lead there. Um, I'm currently a high school senior. <laughs> Um, graduating in three months. Um, and my main interests are um, project management and team management. So I'm hopefully um, interested and able to um, help with sort of coordinating all the efforts and um, hopefully reaching our end goal of having some sort of product or kit that we can distribute. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so uh, David uh, told me that. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, Kat, say somebody else's name from the list. Who's going to next? Uh, Samantha. Hi. <laughs> okay, my name is Samantha, and right now I'm studying bioengineering in UTEC. Um, actually, I am chair of EMBS, an organization about engineer medical engineering and that's that's pretty much about me right now where are you based where are you based yes what where are you based well it, it's sorry it cut at some point okay um i'm come from peru okay awesome okay. welcome <laughs> Thank you. Um, so David doesn't have any mic, but maybe you can write in the chat uh, your own introduction, and then we can read it out. Yeah. So while David's typing that, uh, Sophie, do you want to go next? Uh, okay. So my name is Sophie, and I am a senior at Newport High School in Bellevue, Washington. And I was also on the iGEM team in 2018 and 2019 at SoundBio. And I am interested in studying protein engineering in college. And I'm excited to develop a low cost COVID-19 detection kit. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Sonia, do you wanna go next? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so I'm Sonia. I'm another high school student from Sound Bio, where I was um, a team lead there for the 2019 season. And yeah, I'm a current high school senior, and I'm excited to see where this goes. Excellent. Um, let's see. Let's try Hannah. Do you want to go next? Hi, um, I am a curious onlooker. <laughs> um, I've been speaking uh, with Tomas and Zach and they invited me to listen to what you guys are doing. I'm not contributing for now. Uh, do you want to mention reporter and journalist from Seattle? Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, next. Oh, okay, David just posted. 
Uh, hi, David, uh, high school senior, also on Sound Bio Gym team. Uh, he was another lead, and he's interested in bioengineering. All right. Uh, and that's, that's popcorn over to Kalaumari, if I'm saying that right. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Kalaumari. I'm, I'm a graduate student. I'm studying a PhD in biotechnology. Uh, in Tecnológico in Monterrey, and actually I'm doing a research stay in the Reagan and Women's Hospital and the MIT. So actually I'm in Boston, and well, my area of expertise is the area of biosensors, and my PhD is about developing uh, medical devices, low-cost medical devices for diagnosis. Awesome. So it's uh, an interesting <laughs> <to> project. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hello guys. Uh, my name is Sri. Hello from Lviv, Ukraine. Uh, I'm first of all, I'm totally new in bioengineering or medicine or science, but I have like really strong programming background. I have like more than 12 years in software development. I co-founded one software product company that grown into a really successful company that is right now running on its own. And uh, Recently, like for last four years, I've been actively interested in data science and machine learning. And for the last two years, I'm, I've been working as machine learning engineer. So I'm just curious to see if there will be any need from uh, this kind of uh, perspective. Cool. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Cool. Rachel? I think Rachel, are you the only one left? Yeah. I guess so. And everybody's just been leaving me here. <laughs> <laughs> Three people just left to catch their trains. <laughs> so I'm Rachel. Um, I don't see what it, what it looks like now. I think I have the camera facing me, but I don't see me. Is it working? Yes, it yes. is working. Okay, okay, good. So I'm um, at the Aquarium, Open Lab Aquarium, but in the French way they say Aquarium, which is sort <laughs> of emphasizing the science, uh, open science and transparency and all those good ethics of the DIY bio movement. Although we like to talk about DIT research a lot more now, this do it together is a lot more fun than do it yourself. And um, I'm, I was saying something on Facebook just last week about how shouldn't there be open source testing kits? It shouldn't just be about who's selling the kits. And then it was so great to talk to Thomas yesterday and hear, well, hey, you guys want to move on this. And so I'm glad to be part of this evening's talk. Awesome. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, sir. Um, Tom, do you want to introduce yourself very fast? Sure. <clears throat> I'm a hanger-on. Um, I'm Tom Knight uh, from Jinko Bioworks. Um, I'm not an official part of the DIY bio community, but I'm on the mailing list, and I saw this uh, this meeting and uh, really part of it. Um, I think that uh, you know, there's a real opportunity here, uh, not so much for patient testing, which I think is you know really you should be leading to the profession, but for environmental testing, it seems to me that you know, that could be a really positive thing that could be out of the Awesome. Thank you, Tom, for being here. Um, did we miss anyone? No, Ricardo joined and dropped again. So we can just let's move forward. And if he joins, we can have him in true. All right. Um, so if we go, if we move next on the, the next objectives, so. Um, uh, welcome everyone. This is a beautiful crowd, by the way. <laughs> we probably have um, eight locations, something like that. You know, not bad, not bad. It's a truly international initiative. Um, so uh, the idea is uh, to to agree upon um, like a feasible goal for the, for this initiative. And uh, and and, and it, uh, my pleasure. It seems. <laughs> It seems that uh, it seems that uh, I think we all agree that um, as for for the constraints of of this uh, of these test kits, uh, it should be uh, fully open source. Uh, it should be uh, you know as easy to use as possible. It should be as precise as possible. Um, and so um, 
here we, we would be facing many options, uh, many technologies that we, uh, that we can use and probably would have probably to test different technologies and to compare those. Um, and so, so, so the point is, I think, it's, I think it's a pretty feasible goal to say that we could come up with the first uh, results, uh, you know, coming from um, you know, our first design in uh, let's say like in a month and then maybe like in two months having something that we can provide uh, to the world saying that uh, we can assure some re reproducibility results uh, upon those and uh, and make a statement about it um, i think that would be a pretty good goal maybe it's too ambitious we'll see if we're really able actually to, to move on all together um, and we'll need uh, the work of uh, different uh, you know um, people there, people that have access to laboratories to, to, to make those tests, to have uh, people with different kind of expertise. Um, uh, I've tried to, uh, to, make, uh, uh, to make propositions uh, of sub-objectives here. Uh, and um, I think, uh, I think if, if you agree with that, we could go through them and uh, we could comment. Uh, what's, you know, if, if, it's, if it is for you actually a, like good sub-objectives, um, the one, the first thing, I don't know if, 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 if this issue, how it should be um, written. I've, I've got it uh, knowledge gathering. Um, uh, it's a bad French translation from uh, very scientific. Uh, but if you have a better expression, I'll take it. But basically trying to, uh, to, uh, to, to survey what are the existing uh, methodologies out there uh, for doing uh, RNA virus detection. Um, and uh, there probably are many, um, and we need to see if for each of them, uh, are they open today? Are they covered by patents? Or do we need to uh, maybe create a not, like a, a copy, like a fork of those, uh, of, of those methods and make it so that it becomes open again? No, so that, that is like a, probably like the first step for us to identify those existing methodologies. Um, then something in parallel is some, if, if uh, one person here or even a group of person would be interested in this is to really work on the safety framework for this test. Like um, what, what does it mean to work with uh, viruses? We don't have to work with viable viruses. We can work with genetic materials that are, that are not viable, for example, for lab testing and, uh, and, and the work uh, um, for, for the designing of the protocols. But when it comes to uh, starting to, uh, to use a test on potential, like on yourself, for example, even if you're not sick, or to use it uh, on, on potential people, like your family, for example, people that you already live with, so you're not putting yourself or the others at uh, an, uh, like an extra risk uh, because you're already in contact. Um, like what, what, what are the, the, the key safety measures that we need to design at the core you know, of, the, of the protocol? Um, that, that is a very, very important aspect. Uh, otherwise, um, it could just ruin the, ruin the, the, entire, the entire initiative. Um, then, so what, 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 what do you think of this first step? Like, do, do, you, do you want to propose maybe something else? It's, um, we're completely open. This is really like a, a first draw, uh, if you want. Well, I'll open the discussion then. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I think, I think we should completely avoid trying to do human testing, maybe with the possible exception of testing yourself. Mm -hmm. There's just a, you know, just a ton of problems associated with testing other people. Uh, you know, reliability of the test, uh, you know, human rights, uh, you know, uh, I, I just think we should just say that. Mm. On the other hand, I think there's a huge opportunity for the community, for the DIY virus community to be a positive contributor here. And I think the, the thing that no one else is going to go do, or at least not in the short term, is doing the environmental uh, assessment of what, what is out there uh, in all of our environments. Uh, no one else is going to go out there and squad uh, a subway uh, handrail and tell us whether there's a coronavirus coming. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can do that. Uh, and we can do it, I think we can do it safely, or at least no more unsafely than if you were 
walking through the subway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think that that's a that's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for the community, partly because I think we can make a positive contribution. Secondly, that um, that I think there's not going to be any competition in the short term. You're not going to see the you know, the, the uh, you know, government agencies out doing that. And so uh, you know, we we have a we have an opportunity to go do that. And if you do it well, uh, I think it's going to be a, a really positive uh, real factor in the spread of this. That's a good remark. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, it's 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 a very 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 fair remark, um, and uh, it could be like definitely a first step for us to start doing this, uh, and then um, see how this, for example, could evolve in something that could be applied to more. Uh, human practices, but then working with health professionals, for example. Um, but first, as a first step, probably you're right. Maybe maybe we should start with more environmental monitoring. And uh, what, what do you think, guys? Um, do you want to react? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll check with that. Uh, yeah, I think it makes sense. Like, from my perspective, uh, whether it's the test is used on something that's like an environmental or like a human sample type thing is mostly, not entirely, but mostly could be a matter of like how you market it and like how you say like, hey, we have this test that can detect coronavirus and you can swab a sample from the environment or you can like swab a sample from a human. Um, you could, there's definitely some design decisions where you would be able to whether you're focusing on environmental tests versus human tests, you would maybe make a different decision one way or the other uh, if you're targeting different things. But I think the, a lot of the core fundamentals of whatever thing is developed could probably be easily pivoted from environmental towards human. So it may be best in terms of like the initiative, it may be best for us to start out by outwardly say like working towards like targeting environmental as like kind of the messaging of what we're working on. And then, but then the underlying science would still be readily switched over to a human sample test, I, I think, in most cases, at least. I agree with that. Anyone else? D Rachel? We, we don't hear you, Rachel. She might be talking inside the room, though. Here you go. Okay. You can... Hello? Oh. Yeah. Can I jump yeah. in? OK. So, um... I would say that uh, there's a lot of unknowns. How the method is to be implemented just for the environment or for people or whatever. I think the main risk is what kind of test we decide on and how far we can go towards like making sure that um, say it's a sort of amplification type of protocol something where we make sure that Amplicon doesn't contaminate everything and then you think everything's positive, which can happen, <laughs> especially with really sensitive methods. And so I guess I would say we need a, a positive control that we know isn't dangerous. So some sort of synthetic DNA probably, but then we, we should be testing on RNA in a viral particle really. And so I just see a lot of risks all over this project. And I think it's good to be prudent about saying, yeah, we're aiming to look at the environment because that's gonna protect everyone. But of course, yeah, the science should be valid for everything, but keeping people from contaminating everything around them, so you think there's virus everywhere, is really important not to happen. <laughs> from the beginning, we should say that. I have a question. You stated that we should test for RNA particles in something else. Could you repeat it? I didn't catch on. I, I think viral particle, RNA in the viral particle. Yeah, RNA in the viral particle, right? So in the context where it would be found in the wild, it's not just going to be naked, or it's not going to be our positive control DNA synthetic thing either. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly agree that you know there's the major the major danger here is uh, false positives, and 
the, the main issue there is if we are doing amplification, it seems like it's inevitable. Uh, keeping the amplified products uh, separate from the incoming sample is probably uh, the most difficult thing. And you know, so having very strict methodology which separates the uh, unamplified uh, you know, input samples from the amplified products is, uh, is really going to be a very important part of the, whatever protocols you come up with. Mm. Very, very easy to contaminate you know, the lab environment, not the, not the outside of that, but the lab environment with amplified versions of, uh, of whatever it is you're looking for. So, um, so there's a real, there's a real issue there, and you know that you should be thinking about that early on. By, you know. um. So, so, sounds like we have a, a good um, common objective, um, you know, to do more environmental monitoring than uh, than health testing. Um, in terms of um, patent protections of existing technologies, um, I've seen, for example, that um, uh, Mammoth um technologies has released uh, a method for example using crispr but that's definitely other patent protection um and so um like in in your intuition like uh what do you see what do you think we should actually look after first um and um like we have to do rtpcr we have to do uh, PCR amplification we also may actually use only a uh, peptide assay um uh, like Elisa, for example, Elisa you say. So, um, what what technologies do uh, do you know that are uh, either uh, where the patents are, are expired and we could use today, uh, or are just not under patent? For example, uh, we, we don't have. Yeah. I guess that. Yeah. My my initial going in you know, reaction is let's completely ignore any patents that happen to be out there. If somebody wants to come after us, you know, it isn't like you know, the DIY bio has done. And you know, so uh, you know, what do they do? Are they going to sue us? They sue us. <laughs> <laughs> I like the attitude, Tom. <laughs> All right. Um, so maybe maybe we don't have to be strict about that. Uh, it's true. Um, if we can. If we can, uh, in, 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 the, in the context where um, it's, it's something being used, for example, at the large scale, uh, yeah, it would be strange for, for them to, to go after us, that's true. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's a good point. So we don't have necessary actually to, to, uh, to, to care about uh, pattern protections at first. Um, that's a good point, Tom. Um, all right, um, so, in terms of um, designing the test, so we have different constraints here, uh, and so we we have to uh, to classify the the technologies and the protocols according to uh, how easy they are to implement in terms of biological um, you know implementation uh, and in terms of safety uh, and and precision also. Um, one thing is that uh, that IGM is really good at is uh, is to uh, to be able to really push uh, teams to uh, to uh, to uh, to compare the results. They uh, they have this uh, reproducible um, context contest, you know, in IGM reproducibility contest. Sorry, uh, and I think that we uh, we we have also an opportunity here to run this kind of contest uh, to be able to have a common. Um, protocol and a common way to uh, to test uh, also the protocols that uh, we'll be designing, so that we know for sure that they work in different environments, uh, in different kind of uses, and that results can be uh, compared at the end, even though they, are, they were not made by uh, the same people uh, in the same location. Uh, so that's that's going to be actually a very interesting experiment, not only for us or for in terms of uh, making a, a corona coronavirus test, a diagnosis test, for example, or detection test, but also in terms of what it means to, uh, to make reproducible science. 
Um, um, so I think I think it looks, don't hesitate to interrupt me, right? So uh, I'm I'm just I'm just following the the list, uh, you know, of uh, of objectives for this call. Um, so so it looks to me that um, like who who here would would like to um, that we have we have to identify uh, also people that wants to to take care more of a certain part than than others and take some kind of lead, um, and um, so so. Regarding the first part in terms of literature review, uh, you know, knowledge gathering, um, and then we will look at uh, the second part, which is like design, designing the test and finally testing the protocols. So we we have we have very different needs uh, that that requires different uh, resources and expertise. Um, so. Um, among yourself, like where do you see maybe uh, the, maybe that that would be a question I could have asked at the very beginning. But um, individ individually, where do you see yourself uh, today? Like where do you would like to actually put your energy uh, in you that framework? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Ricardo here. One of the things that I'd be interested in would be to, uh, I mean, of course, specificity and appropriate detection are really important but one of the things that I'd like to focus is how reproducible is this test going to be in places like Mexico, Central America, Latin America. That's one of the things that I'd like to be focusing on like is this test like require a lot of uh, specific equipment or is this something that can be run uh, simply with a tech that can be available everywhere? I think that's a great question and I think, <clears throat> I think what, what it comes down to is what does the readout look like? And so, um, I think most of the most of the you know, sort of laboratory level tests that are currently being used rely on a combination of uh, reverse transcriptase followed by PCR. Often, the PCR is done with a quantitative PCR machine, and those quantitative PCR machines. Uh, you know, are uh, pretty expensive and not widely available probably to the DIY buyer community. But that wouldn't stop us from, for example, simply over amplifying a sample and running a gel, which I think most of the community is pretty help, pretty confident that they can do that. So I think that would be the, that's sort of the opening answer. Uh, can you if you if you do PCR, you get the band. You know, if the band is the right size, uh, you you, know, you can call that as a positive. Now, uh, you'd like to be able to do that not with one reaction, but with I think there's I think there's tests out there that you know that have you know four or or more uh, primer pairs that uh, that are you know, used in the application and. You know, so you know, a positive sample should have all of those things. And uh, you know, I think you know, we, can, we can do that. And I think we can do that in a DIY environment. The best thing to do would be then to take those bands and actually sequence them. And I'm not suggesting that that's something that the DIY by community can be easily be able to do without access to sequencers and or, or alternatively with money. And uh, you know, so we should probably uh, leave that uh, optional or leave that to a next stage of development. But uh, you, know, you can get started with some very simple mechanisms. Out there. I think that uh, for the, well, there are like two, two types of tests that can be developed mainly, PCR-based tests or also some kind of ELISA test. And obviously each one has its advantage and disadvantages. I, I have seen that both of them, there are some already some commercial options. And I think that also we need to consider uh, the specificity because I have seen that some of the coronavirus, there are some tests that are more general and maybe, maybe it's, it's enough. We don't need an, a, a very specific test for this type of coronavirus, maybe we can we can use a test that is more general, and we, we can take also advantage if, the, if there is 
cross reaction, like for example, in I have seen some some early success based on antibodies. Maybe there's cr uh, cross reaction with different uh, coronavirus, but in, in in our case, maybe that's enough uh, for for the test. We maybe don't need a very specific, and it's easier to get these antibodies that are general in comparison. To I'm not aware that we have more virus. So I think that in that sense that that's one one option. The other option is obviously the PCR amplification based technology that also has some some disadvantages in that sense because it's not so easy to have the rectal transcription and then some PCR. Uh, it's not easy to implement outside the lab if you don't have the, the platform for that. Uh, and I think that for the case of the Elizabeth test, well, the main limitation is to get the proper antibodies in a large quantity in order to make it cheap. And providing at a large scale because antibodies are not so cheap, and, and especially if you require a high concentration of them. And for the other, and on the other hand, for the PCR techniques, uh, there are some interesting approaches that are uh, more portable and that can be implemented in the field. But I think that some of these approaches they are already patented, and some companies uh, have them. I, I don't know if it's better to develop our own system or to try to use one that is commercially uh, available because. In many of the, these uh, these uh, PCR uh, based kits, the business of the company is not the equipment, but they try to sell the reagents and all that stuff that is required. And that's the I have seen that the business model is focused on that, on buying the reagents and stuff like that. And sometimes these reagents are not so so cheap. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I just want to jump in really quick. Um, uh, so just like making sure we keep an eye on time. We've got a little over 20 minutes left. We've got a couple other topics I think we can switch to. But I think like so I think the discussion is good. Um, but uh, in terms of being like a initial meeting, it, I think it'd be better to focus our energy because like this sounds like a lot of good like technical discussion of like some of the options that may exist. Uh, I think we still have like some research to kind of continue doing and like see what options we've seen. Uh, there's a lot of papers that have come out very recently with like even tests that don't require any equipment at all and don't require like any ELISA type of antibodies and things. Uh, so we can, there's a lot of research that we've done, a lot of cool new things that have come out in the last couple of years that we can leverage, but we should do that on the research piece. Uh, one thing I think that uh, Ricardo's question brought up for me is like, what, how do we want to prioritize like the direction we want to take the project? Um, so we can either discuss right now or maybe we can do this kind of offline over the next day or two, but think about like what are the questions and the priorities of where we want to focus our energy. So to Ricardo's point, um, there's a uh, tests that we could run is like obviously like an RT-PCR test which is like I think the most common one being used for coronavirus today uh, that uh, requires obviously expensive equipment and that's not going to be available like Harry is logged in he's over in Ghana and I'm guessing he probably doesn't have a QPCR machine over there uh, or maybe he does because uh, he's, a, he's a pretty lucky location with um, the collaborations he's got but a lot of other places out especially across Africa and South America they just won't have access to that type of stuff so uh, in my mind I think it'd be best for us to discuss uh, either here or very quickly early on this project, like what are the prioritizations uh, among those types of questions? So I don't know if somebody has something yeah. along those lines. So I, I was trying to suggest that I don't think the qPCR version of PCR is necessary, uh, <clears throat> at least in the short term. It's <clears throat> desirable, but not necessary. And so I think a conventional PCR machine would be just fine. Uh, I don't, I, I will admit to being a little ignorant about this, but I was not aware that uh, that there were good uh, antibodies available for uh, coronavirus. Uh, if there are, that's a game changer uh, and uh, would be the basis of, I think, another way of doing some of these tests. Uh, I I would be surprised, frankly, that there uh, are good antibodies against coronavirus, or the specific coronavirus that we're talking about. Yeah, I think, but I think broadly, even if like there's antibodies, like there's different tests that may have reagents that require cold storage and that may limit like its applicability in certain regions of the world as well. So I think defining what the priorities are, like, do we want to focus on 
purely just like making something open source so other commercial entities can produce it at a higher volume and then sell it in more places? Or do we want to focus on uh, broadening the scope of which locations of the world are capable of running these types of tests? Because places out in remote Africa are not going to be able to get something, any samples in time to a lab that has the capabilities to run these tests as they are today. Um, so like one opportunity in my mind is we can like build new new novel tests that can actually be deployed and used out in the field as opposed to having to grab a sample and bring it back to some place that has uh, more advanced equipment. But I think it's, that's open like, to the community of people here that wants to help uh, do, drive this uh, development. That's a good research project and I can imagine a number of those that could, based, that could be based, for example, on some total techniques uh, for and, and maybe some cell free expression system on paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a number of number of those technologies I think we could look at. Um, those are all going to be things that are going to require some time to develop. And uh, so I, mean, I, but I think there's there's some very simple versions of that immediately, but which you know, I think uh, would work very, very well in Paris. And maybe we should be doing both of those things. So I would just maybe add into the mix one thing about the need for a PCR machine can be sort of simplified with more primers. So if you do isothermal amplification, um, then you get, it's not really something you can look for the band on a gel for sure. You need better uh, detection strategies, but um, it can be something where just at 63 degrees, you get your amplification product. And the surprising thing is how well these mixes of the reagents, all these primers plus the proteins can be lyophilized and then used almost anywhere. But it's so sensitive, that's even more of a risk in terms of the false positives from previous amplicons. Well, that's a very good point. Uh, I would also point out that you know there's a perception that you need a PCR cycler in order to do PCR. But you know, in the old school, uh, three water baths at three different temperatures and moving the rack between the three water baths <laughs> really does work. And they used to add Klenau enzyme also at each cycle, right? But I mean, now that there are other alternatives and um, yeah, hopefully to have some new novel test that didn't have such a risk of this contamination with Amplicon, I think would be great. Um, so Ma, do we want to... Okay. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Uh, sorry, I joined in a little late. Uh, so I've been following the conversation so far, and uh, I think I, I pick. Uh, I'm in the center of the discussion. So I mean, if you ask me my thoughts on, um, I mean, what would be one of the best approach in developing uh, a diagnostic uh, test that could uh, actually be, uh, I mean, have a lot of impact in Africa, not only in developed countries. I think there are quite a number of effort currently in making the PCR technology really accessible here in Africa. And a lot of researchers and, uh, I mean, people who directly want to look at the molecular uh, diagnostic point of view are looking into PCR. So one of the research work that has currently been ongoing in the high bio lab, uh, which I co-founded with uh, Jenny Molloy and some groups of people, we have been trying to uh, produce what we call uh, open, uh, produce, Patent, uh, enzymes which are of patents and at the end of the day because we're trying to have this easily accessible to other research labs we try as much as possible to lawfulize them using um, I mean crude methods so we produce the enzymes in cellular forms uh, DNA polymerases in uh, cell, uh, cellular reagents and then lawfulize them and uh, we have been trying this out uh, on a number of uh, protocols PCR protocols and they seem to have been working very well uh, not too long ago, we produced a number of uh, polymerases. Uh, we produced what we call the deep, deep vent polymerase, which is um, a T7 induced, uh, which is under the in, um, influence of the T7 promoter. Uh, and we are calling it the um, open vent because it has expired. So there are a number of, um, I mean, 
let me put it, uh, initiatives that are trying to solve the region accessibility, trying to make these technologies easily accessible. And if you ask me right now to develop um, a point of care, I think PCR is red, uh, these are two thermocyclists are far more uh, in, the, in the African markets that will make these things or this method for uh, the coronavirus easily detectable once we, we have what, what it takes to do them. So one other thought would be the loop uh, mediated amplification. However, the, the questions of contamination uh, is, is where the, the challenge comes in because we, we have labs that are capable of running this, but most of them are academic labs. So the degree at which we want most of these things to go may not happen just like we want it since we are leveraging uh, community labs and DIY uh, biospaces to do that. In Africa, we have very limited of such labs and the challenges are often question myself. We, we do not have the biosafety levels to handle these things. Uh, except, of course, we, are, uh, we have these technologies developed. If it's going to be a cell-free system that is paper-based and we are using them in the field, then obviously that's doable. But then, then before we can have the, the, the possibilities of testing some of these things ourselves, we need to, uh, I mean, get our biosafety to that level where we, we then can say that we can handle and contribute effectively to developing a diagnostic that can be used in Africa because Africans co created this and they, they know uh, what works for them and what do not work for them. So they are bringing this on the table. So this is what I think. So Harry, I'm glad to hear you're working with Jenny. Uh, please give her my regards if you uh, talk to her. And yeah, thanks. I, I remember meeting you last uh, during the uh, Ginkgo ferment and I had a picture with <laughs> ah, very good. And uh, you know, let, me, let me tell all of you that are on the line, um, if any of you are you know, saying, boy, I wish I had enough money or resources to get an X, you know, like a PCR cycler, or, uh, you know, uh, I wish I was able to synthesize these primers, but uh, you know, they cost money, or I wish I had enough money to make this positive control, which is you know a, a thousand kb, uh, a thousand cases of, of DNA. Um, please let me know because we can probably do that. We can probably find the equipment. We can get it cheap. We could get it to you. Uh, so reach out. You're awesome, Tom. Thanks so much. This is great. Um, so uh, we're getting close to uh, to to uh, to the hour of discussion already, and so we haven't touched all the subjects yet. So I propose that we uh, we, we move on. So the um, I think I think one of the key objectives of this call is really to uh, to be able to uh, to agree upon uh, so those sub objectives, uh, but also to identify people that would like to take some leads. Uh, on those sub objectives um, and so um, that would that would be great if you could think um, about what would, what would you like to focus on uh, as an individual um, some people are running labs so it makes sense probably you know that, that you prepare yourself to uh, to um, to uh, to test you know and to, to work on the test condition of the of the protocols uh, um, people are also you, you are you are living in different in different countries in different uh, situations different environments so it would be great actually to uh, to propose your own constraints like what would make sense for you uh, for having a diagnosis test um, so we could imagine having different uh, sections within the the, um, the lab notebook of the of the initiative um, and and uh, and so if finally is uh, we can um, we can also uh, move on with, uh, let's say, I think, I think Tom has, uh, has uh, helped us understand you know, how we could solve part of our uh, issue of fabrication, for example, because you know, if, we, uh, if, if we need, for example, uh, you know, samples, uh, primers, we know that we can count on each other and that there are uh, members here that have ac better access to resources than others. And so 
what Tom did, I'm sure others will do also. And uh, so thank you, Tom, for showing the, the, the example here. Um, um, I guess that, uh, I don't know how you want to, 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 to make it happen. Uh, um, I, think, I think that I would like to propose maybe that um, you indicate in the Google Doc uh, at what, what section you'd like to, uh, to focus on uh, yourself, where you feel more relevant. Uh, or more fascinated by, by, by the subject. Um, and then uh, I think we could also probably continue uh, the, the discussion on the, the Google Doc uh, where you know, we really start. I think, I think one thing that we need to, uh, to, to agree upon is do we want to use Google Doc uh, <laughs> you know, as a lab notebook? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big subject. So it's, it's free, it's pretty much available almost anywhere almost, you know, uh, anywhere in the world. Um, if you have an alternative, please um, speak up. It needs to be free. It needs to be easy to use. Um, what, like, what are the alternatives for you there? Yeah, obviously, uh, for me, I have been using Benchlink, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure a number of you have used Benchlink. The reason why I would go into Benchlink is that one, it has uh, an integrated notebook, so that allows you to, uh, I mean, work and have others also come contribute. But then you are not able to see who is contributing at what point. That's that's the only challenge. Also, it also has what we call the inventory. So if you are working on sequences, you have, uh, I mean, any other sequence, whether primer sequences or, I mean, a, a genome sequence, you still can have all those things uh, incorporated into your. Uh, inventory and it helps you to take stock of them. It's also very easy, especially if you want to do some basic um, bioinformatics, you want to check your primates and all that. So that's one advantage of that tool, which I, I think we can obviously use. But for collaborative working, for me, uh, I would say we can, we can just do with the Google Docs because you are able to see real time and work uh, on um, the document real time with other groups of people. But I mean, to have things officially documented, we obviously can pull all those documents and have them stored on uh, Benchling, especially if you have other resources we still want to attach to this project so that we don't have different uh, informations at different points where we have everything fully documented on one group. Uh, Tama, you're, you're muted. Um, yes, uh, thanks, Harry. I've never used benching myself, but um, I, I don't know. Like, do they have like um, you know a free uh, option for groups? Um, I've been able to make free ones. I'm not sure if that's like changed over the years. Um, I think it's like possible. So, like, my my thought on this is Google Docs would be like a way of like like Harry was saying, kind of we can share all the more like ad hoc and researchy type stuff. And then I think within the, any given lab, um, they can probably just like use whatever lab notebooking tool yeah. works best for them. But then ideally at least have either way to export the lab notebooks um, or use, uh, like with Benchling, there's a way you can like directly share the lab notebooks. So like digitally <laughs> shareable uh, online. So that's, that's great. So I, I'd recommend Benchling as like one way of doing it, but I think any data that kind of, uh, benching is a great way for visualizing all the se sequence related data. So that's definitely a good tool for that. Um, but like centralizing any of the other data, we can upload it to this Google Drive folder that we have and just share all the stuff centrally here and then kind of use whatever tool works best locally as needed to do execute on things. Okay, that sounds great. Um, uh, I think we've, any, you know, anyone can use whatever they want as, as a tool for themselves, but as long as they copy uh, what they've written down uh, on the Google Doc, that will work. One other thing is, uh, if you come up with uh, like an exciting results or or something you want to share with the community, don't hesitate to use so the Google platform as when when you write down you know on the feed, that will send out uh, a, like um, um, how, do you, how do you call this um, announcements, an announcement, announcements, <laughs> updates, yeah. yeah, exactly updates to the to the rest of the of the team. Um, so so that's that's basically useful. At the end, what we will do also is that. Uh, every time that we have like a, a consequent uh, advancements on the on the on the project, we will update the the description of the project on the Google page too, so that people can stay up to date without necessarily going through all the the lab notebook. Um, 
I think uh, that, I think that's it for for the for the tools. Do you do you see that? Well, I would, yeah. The other thing I would think though is um, communication tools. Like there's been uh, a couple of options either using like a WhatsApp group text or like uh, Slack or anything. So I don't know if people right. for like more ongoing conversations to have more quick rapid fire uh, shooting ideas back and forth. Um, I don't know what people's thoughts are on either of those or other options as well. Yeah, sounds good. Um, what do you guys prefer, like WhatsApp, Slack? It seems like WhatsApp as as a, as a start would be simpler, no? I be simpler, yeah. yeah. Um, I have I have a few ideas on this actually. Um, I would personally vote for a move to Slack. I think that as this project grows and as we specialize into specific areas, depending on how this branches out, um, Slack will be a lot easier to. Um, you know, organize the conversation so it's not just one big group. Okay. Um, and I think right now, even though we don't have those focuses, we can just use the general channel feature on Slack. So it's similar mm -hmm. to just like a WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. um, the only question would be whether or not Slack is available everywhere. I think it should be since it's on both the iOS and Android platforms, mm -hmm. um, if it's not accessible online. But that's something like Slack or even Discord, but I prefer personally prefer to the Google Drives and Docs, so it's easier to share things into the channel. Um, that's my personal two cents, but I don't know if anyone has other like platforms or stuff they like to use. I agree yeah. um, that I like Slack. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I would say we've had some good luck using Evernote for the lab notebook that you can share sort of an experiment really easily. It's a digital sharing thing, but it's not that great for like showing plasmid preps or whatever, but it's, it's good for many things, Evernote. But Slack, I like too. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so what, what we can do is, if, if, I think everyone agrees here, uh, that we can set up a, an open Slack, meaning that we can just put an address uh, so that uh, if someone wants to, to join the team later on, they can just you know join the Slack automatically. We don't put any restriction. Um, um, does that sound good to you? Yeah, I've got a Slack already up and running. I just made one naturally uh, from starting another <laughs> project, but <laughs> um, so so I can I can I can post info. I can get all that set up for you guys. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we we put the uh, the other thought the other yeah. question on my mind was um, like uh, this is I guess is this your Tom Toma your Zoom thing? Yeah. I, so like I have my own Zoom as well that I can make it easily accessible for others to use. Um, so we can either use it on ad hoc basis, but also I think it'd be great for us to have like maybe even like once a week because like the urgency around trying to get the progress on this. So if we can like try and schedule calls. So we only schedule it right now, but um, maybe I can throw together like a when to meet or some sort of other scheduling helper type thing to kind of see like what times work well. And one thing I was messaging Toma about just before the call was, He's based in Paris. I'm based on the west coast of the United States. Uh, so it's like two quite different time zones, and each of us could kind of like lead one different calls. Uh, so like kind of if we have two weekly calls that are offset in their time zone. So like it's easy for people. It should be a comfortable time to join at least one of them, and both of us can try and like write up summaries and record things and share all that stuff, so we can all be up to date. Uh, I don't know if people have uh, thoughts on that or anything. Yeah, I actually think that would be pretty helpful, especially for those of us that have school most days. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm like on Wednesdays, we have like half days, but most days we have full days of school. So it's nice if we're able to have like a, a West Coast or even just a US based or that side of the world <laughs> based <laughs> call. Um, and obviously, if there's like overlaps in timing, you know, we can join the other ones, what have you. But and with like the recording feature on Zoom or whatever platform, I think that would be, be useful. Yeah, I think it's a great idea also, uh, especially that with with being so late uh, here on in, in Europe, it makes it difficult for people to join, uh, especially if you're also more in the East, uh, for example, in India, or you know even you know further out, like in China, for example, in Japan. So. Um, Having a double schedule uh, call uh, is could, could solve that definitely. Yeah, um, we just we just need to maybe like we could set up a, a common day like Wednesday sounds like a good day. Um, I'll send out a um, a one to meet or something to get kind of gauge people's best availabilities like across mm -hmm. the whole week, and then from that I'll pick <clears throat> whatever time works. Sounds great. 
All right. I think uh, it's uh, <laughs> we've covered we've covered all the basics. Um, we will put up some uh, some surveys uh, for you know, the agenda, uh, the preferences, also what kind of roles or preferences you want to, uh, you know, what kind of sub-objectives you want to pick up better. Uh, we'll set up the Slack, we'll share the links, and here we go. You know? <laughs> Let's make it happen. Uh, before, before, we leave it, we, we, before we leave each other, uh, you know, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to, uh, to make a, a simple thing. Like to, to, I, would like, I would take a, a screen capture and if we could all say hi, you know, and then we, I can I can share this picture with the social networks. Are you, do you agree with that? Can you activate your your webcam for just for a minute? <laughs> we are like. <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> guys, you can say hi. You know, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> 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 Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I also shared the link for, for the video that has been recorded uh, so that people can listen to what we've said also if they want to catch up or if you want to re listen maybe also uh, what has been said, uh, maybe for not taking, for example. Thank you again. Have a great evening, a great lunch or a great morning. I don't know where you are. <laughs> 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 but it was great talking to you all of you. I'm looking forward to the next uh, to the next meeting. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you guys. See you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. See you.